Coming up on today's program, we do a portfolio report card for AT in Glendale, Arizona. This is a $1.9 million inherited IRA. The question is, does it pass or does it fail? You're about to find out right now on the portfolio report card, so stick around. I'm Ron DeLegge with ETF Guide TV and inventor of the Portfolio Report Card. It's great to have you with us. This is where we analyze and grade your investments. We congregate every single week to tell you about the structural strengths and weaknesses of your investments. And let me just re-familiarize you, if you're not familiar with the process. I look at your investment portfolio's architectural strength in key areas like cost, risk, taxes, diversification, performance, organization, and behavior. And then, then we can know, we can understand what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, and where you need to improve. And then we give you a final grade. And that final grade is reported in the form of a letter grade of A, B, C, D, or F. Obviously, I want to see lots of A's and B's, but if we get a C, a D, or F on the show, then that means that, listen, this portfolio needs some work, and we've identified the weak spots, so now it's up to you, after we've identified those weak spots, to make those fixes, make those changes. Incomplete scores rarely happen on the show, but if we don't have enough data and we can't make an informed assessment, then we'll get an incomplete score. Uh, We haven't had one on the show yet. The Portfolio Report Card is an actual one-page report that you get. And all the report cards that we do on this show, the recipients get that one-page report, which describes exactly all these key areas. The subgrades in each of those categories formerly formerly mentioned, like cost, risk, tax, diversification, performance, behavior, and um, the like. And then it doesn't matter if the portfolio's as little as 25000 or up to $10 billion, it's always going to be on one page. And that's the, the beauty of the design of the report card is the fact that it's, it's so simple, but at the same time, very thorough and comprehensive and very um, tightly woven. And then your first report card is always what we call your baseline score. So we identify where you're at today. Then when I regrade the portfolio in a year from now, We can see, engage whether you've made progress or whether you've digressed or whether you've maintained. And that way we can make sure that we're always constantly moving closer and closer towards our financial investment goals. And I also analyze and grade both self-managed portfolios as well as advisor-managed portfolios. So without further ado, we're going to take a look at this portfolio, give you some quick background on AT. This is a $1.9 million inherited IRA. She's 52. She's single. And for those of you single guys, you desperate guys looking for a date, don't ask me to hook you up with AT because I'm not going to do that. I mean, what do I look like? Chuck Chuck Woolery? I mean, does this look like the love connection? Because it's the portfolio report card last time I checked. So I'm not going to hook you up with her, although she, she is probably a pretty good catch. But the point here is that she has inherited a lot of money. She works in the healthcare field, and she wants to know if she's going to be on track, if she's going to be okay in terms of uh, some goals that she's got. She's a growth investor. She's got 12 years to go before retiring, and she wants to know how she should be positioning herself for that. Should she keep? Should she sell some of these assets in this inherited IRA? Where should she reinvest those those proceeds if she decides to get rid of some of them or all of them? And then how are her taxes going to be impacted by this inherited IRA? So we're going to go through all of these details on the show. I want to just say that inherited investments, any of us that are in this situation of where we are have inherited, whether it's an IRA or other assets, it's tough. You know, inherited IRAs and assets are have very complex distribution and tax rules. The money often comes with uh, emotional baggage of guilt, uh, regret, and other very messy feelings. And the biggest obstacle, I think, of all is that the inherited assets, whether they be an IRA or some other types of investments, 
They were built for the deceased owner's goals. They were not built necessarily for the surviving beneficiaries, and that often leads to discrepancies in the compatibility between the portfolio's composition and the risk tolerance and the goals of the beneficiaries. And so we're going to take a look and see with this inherited IRA if, if we're able to identify any potential discrepancies or, or areas that may raise some red flags. So AT, as I mentioned, is the sole beneficiary. This is a $1.9 million inherited IRA from her late uncle. He passed away earlier this year. We're sorry to hear about that loss of your, your uncle, AT. Please accept our condolences. And uh, this is a, a pretty nice windfall nonetheless from your late uncle, and it clearly shows that he had a lot of affection for you. Now, the real question is, what type of grade does this inherited IRA get? Uh, the only way we're going to know the answer to that question is by doing a portfolio report card. So let's get right into it. This is the portfolio. Um, as you can see, it's got seven individual REITs, which is an acronym for Real Estate Investment Trust. And uh, these are these are investments that are primarily designed to generate income and cash flow for shareholders. And so that is a major part of the portfolio. And then there's two ETFs from iShares. One of them is a REIT ETF. The other one is a, a government bond fund. That's TLT and ICF. And then there's one mutual fund from Schwab. Uh, this is a government money fund, ticker symbol SNVXX. So... Uh, the dollar figures too, by the, the I, by the way, I should mention have been rounded. Um, so let's look at look at the first grading category, which is cost. Now this portfolio um, does not have really um, much exposure to mutual funds or ETFs. The the bulk of the portfolio, as as you saw there, is parked in individual REITs. But if we just extract for a minute the ETF and the mutual fund holdings, we're looking at a cost in the vicinity of 0.34%. And that 0.34% basically is what, uh, I'm sorry, 0.32% is represents the just the fund portion. So we want to minimize to the greatest degree possible those reoccurring fund expenses. There is some fat to cut here, especially with the SVNXX, which charges 0.34% annually. That's way too expensive for this type of low-yielding government bond fund. There's plenty of low-cost choices in the ETF world uh, of funds that do basically the same thing that charge up to 90% less. Now, thankfully, you'll notice that this is not a very large portion of the overall portfolio. It only represents a little over $56,000 in change of a almost $2 million portfolio. So it's really not a deal breaker, but it's certainly an area that can, can be improved. Trading costs have been pretty light and they have not added significantly uh, to this portfolio's overall cost over the past year. So pretty good job in terms of minimizing cost. Next up is diversification. And how does this portfolio do? Well, you take a look at the breakdown, we got exposure to two major asset classes, real estate and bonds. You see this portfolio has the bulk of its if, if its exposure to real estate, 95%, and then just 5% bonds. It misses a couple of major areas like stocks, as well as commodities and cash. So it comes up short in that area. Also, the other thing to keep in mind, if we take a look at the portfolio's composition, it owns a lot of the same stuff. ICF is a REIT ETF, which already owns the same individual REITs held in the other places of AT's portfolio. So this creates what we call over-diversification, again, where you own too much of the same stuff and not enough of everything else. So it's unnecessary replication, and this portfolio is clearly over-diversified. Next up is risk. So we want to see portfolios that, that align perfectly with a person's risk profile and risk tolerance. The risk character of the portfolio should perfectly match that. And this portfolio, if we examine it a little bit more closely, uh, we take a look at the holdings. Most of them are income-oriented types of holdings. That's what REITs are all about. And that dividends are the focus. Yet, AT described herself as a growth investor. 
And that's very different than a dividend investor. And so the risk character of the portfolio, as I see it, is not suitable to AT. Now, it may have been suitable to her late uncle, who was clearly a dividend income type of investor, but we're talking about AT right now. This is her money. She's the beneficiary. And so the money needs to real be realigned to match her. As I like to say, if the portfolio does not align, that means you must redesign. And so this is what needs to happen with this portfolio. The risk character needs to correctly match up with AT's risk profile. And she's a growth investor, so the portfolio should represent that. And currently it doesn't. Next up is the taxes. Taxes, as we know, can be a very complicated subject for many. We try to keep it simple. You've got three areas where your money can be invested, your taxable, tax-deferred, or tax-free bucket. So we're talking about asset positioning. And I, I try to stress this with the portfolio report card, and, and hopefully it's coming through to some of you, that a well-built investment portfolio is not just about smart investment positioning. It's also about smart asset positioning. Asset positioning deals with how the, the money is spread out in terms of these three buckets or containers, taxable, tax deferred, tax free. We want to minimize taxes and the threat of rising taxes to the greatest degree possible. And so non-spousal inherited IRAs, and that's what this is that AT's got, you have much less flexibility compared to a spouse to spouse inherited IRA. And since AT's late uncle passed away in 2020, that means that the clock is ticking for AT because she now has 10 years from the death of her uncle to begin withdrawing and completely empty out all of the money from this inherited IRA. And so the question is, well, what about taxes? How's that going to impact her? Well, you'll see as the money comes out of that tax bucket number two, the def tax deferred, she's going to pay federal and state income taxes on that money. And then that's going to be going back into her taxable bucket. And so once it gets into the taxable bucket, the question is then what does she do with the money, right? So the, these taxes, by the way, are unavoidable. Uh, when you have an inherited IRA, you've got 10 years. That's according to the latest rules for this non-spousal IRA to have those assets uh, come back to you. And, and you pay tax on those. So we're, we can't avoid that. But what we can do is we can take advantage of historically low U.S. income tax rates, which are going to stay the same until 2026, unless there's some massive change in current tax law. We'll have to see if that happens. But if everything stays the same, tax rates here in the U.S. are not going to change between now and 2026. So that gives us some stability in U.S. income tax rates. And like I said, we're at the third lowest rate over the past 80 years. And so not a bad situation which to be paying taxes in AT. So don't complain about it. It's a lot better than it was in the past. And it's a lot better than it will be in the future because tax rates in this country are going to skyrocket. And so the question then becomes is we know all this money is going to be coming back to AT over a 10-year time frame, $1.9 million. After AT has paid taxes on that, the question is, then what's going to happen with that money? Well, it's up to AT to redeploy that money. And that's where step number two comes in. You see that arrow going back. Hopefully, AT can be redeploying some of these assets, this money back into the tax-free zone. Things like Roth 401k, Check with your 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 work, your your place of, of your job to see if Roth 401ks are a choice. Roth IRA contributions, I don't think in this case, are going to be an option for um, AT just because the income is going to be so high that you're going to be phased out for making Roth, regular Roth IRA contributions. And if there's no Roth 401k, well, then you can make regular contributions to your 401k, and uh, then look at maybe reconverting some of those assets into, you know, getting getting them into the Roth via conversions. So that would be another way, kind of a backdoor way to get into the tax-free zone. So the, the real point here on taxes is to the extent that AT starts re redeploying 
the inherited IRA distributions into the tax-free zone, that's going to determine how well her portfolio does on taxes from this point forward. Now, she hasn't taken any distributions thus far, so it's too early for me to really judge whether she's making the right moves tax-wise. So right now, we've given her some really awesome clues about what she should be doing in order to reposition her portfolio for a really good grade on taxes in, in the future. Finally, let's take a look at, um, oh, this, this, this slide points out, um, and this is a good rough guide in terms of the mathematically ideal balance that each one of these buckets has. So your taxable it should have six months of emergency living expenses. Your tax deferred bucket should have an ideal balance where your RMDs at age 72 are at or below your standard deduction. And that varies. If you're married, it's $24,000 and change. If you're single, it's $12,000 and change. So you want to make sure that your RMDs at age 72 are at or below that. If they are, then that, that RMD is essentially tax-free. Now, you got to keep in mind that there's other factors that could bump up your income. So you may need to keep that balance in those tax-deferred accounts even lower, especially if you've got a pension or rental income then you may have to have that tax deferred bucket possibly at zero and have everything else in your tax free zone. And then of course the tax free refers to your ideal balance is going to be everything over and beyond the limits of one and two. So that's just kind of a rough sketch of correct asset positioning. So performance, this is the final category that we're going to take a look at for AT's portfolio. Um, lost almost 12% over the past year versus about a 9.5% loss for the benchmark. The portfolio report card, those of you wondering, well, what is a benchmark? Well, a benchmark is a automatically built for you. It's customized to your portfolio's asset mix so that we get an apples-to-apples -apples view of your portfolio's performance. So we would never take an all-equity benchmark, a 100% equity benchmark, and compare that to a portfolio like this, which is made up of 95% REITs and 5% bonds. We want to have uh, index benchmarks that that closely replicate the asset asset allocation of, of the investment. So that's what we've done here with the report card. And AT's portfolio underperformed. It did slightly worse. And so there's some improvement that could be made. I mean, a couple of things that jump out to me on performance. Um, REITs, first of all, haven't been good performers over the past year. That's the first thing. The second thing is that it's just hard to beat indexes. And when you assemble a portfolio like this built with individual REITs, individual bricks, it's hard to beat the building with an individual bricks when you have the indexes out there where you could build a portfolio just like this using a, a low-cost ETF that um, you know would, would accomplish the same sort of mission with a lot less management and and performance that that would uh, definitely um, not underperform the benchmark. So that's just something to keep in mind in terms of performance. The final grade for AT's portfolio is a D, and it's important here for us to take a look at the strengths of the portfolio as well as the weaknesses. Clearly, this portfolio did okay when it came to minimizing cost. The portfolio needs some work and improvement on diversification, on risk, getting that portfolio recalibrated to match AT. And that's, we saw some major discrepancies there. Performance, it lagged uh, relative to the benchmark. And so there's some improvements that can be made there. And so this portfolio, some of you watching may be puzzled to see a $1.9 million portfolio get a grade of D. I mean, how, how is that possible, Ron? You're crazy. Well, remember, the size or dollar value of the portfolio in itself does not determine whether the portfolio is architecturally sound. It's the grading factors that we previously discussed that reveal to us, that tell us whether the portfolio is well-built and suitable or not. And so you need to remember that. Uh, that it's it, it it's not the size of the portfolio, but it's the composition of the assets. It's its asset positioning, and um, all of that 
are factors that we look at with the portfolio report card. So thank you, AT, for taking Ron DeLegge's portfolio report card. We've got some, some tips here that I think can help you out in terms of better grades in the future when we look at this portfolio again. You've got some work to do in terms of getting the portfolio better aligned with who you are as a growth investor. This clearly is a dividend income portfolio, so that needs to be recalibrated. Increasing tax efficiency, taking those distributions that are going to happen over the next 10 years and carefully, systematically redeploying them into the tax-free zone. And then I didn't see any written investment plan. I suppose even if this portfolio did have one, it, it probably would have been one from AT's uncle, which wouldn't have matched up with AT's growth investing orientation. So it wouldn't have mattered. But AT, that's something else that needs to be added to the mix. Um, I've got some online templates that you can use um, on in my online classes, Build, Grow, and Protect Your Money, a step-by-step -step guide. I'll put a link below and you can get that template. And then... Um, that's about it. Thank you, AT, for taking my report card challenge. And keep in mind, a D is your baseline score. And when I regrade your portfolio in a year from now, we're going to see if you've made progress or not. If you go from D to C or B or A, well, then you've made some progress, and that's good. Uh, however, if you go from D to D or D to F, then you're still stuck in the mud. But I want to see an A or a B from UAT and from, from all of our viewers that, that take the Portfolio Report Card Challenge. And, and hopefully what I've shared with you in this episode uh, can keep you on track. So what about the rest of us? How are we doing when it comes to our investment portfolios? What are your portfolio strengths? What are your portfolio's weaknesses? Do you have any hidden problems that could maybe blow you up? Are you taking too much risk? Maybe you don't have an adequate cushion or adequate margin of safety. Maybe your portfolio hasn't done as well as you think it should have done. We've had a pretty favorable uh, stock market over the past year. We did have a, a major sell-off there in the spring of 2020, but markets have come back pretty strong. But now is a good time to be asking these questions. Maybe you have a financial advisor who's managing your money and you're not sure if they're overcharging you or if they're executing properly. Well, I'll be glad to analyze and grade your portfolio independently. So go to PortfolioReportCard.com to get started and we'll get to the bottom of it. Get in touch with me and I'll be happy to analyze and grade your portfolio. And I look at portfolios from all types of institutions. These are just some of them. As you can see, let me just uh, put this up here so you can see this. These are just some of the uh, institutions that I've analyzed and graded portfolios from. So um, I'll be happy to look at what you've got and help you out. And that does it for this episode of the Portfolio Report Card. Be sure to like this video if you enjoyed it. And uh, don't forget to watch my other weekly series, ETF Battles. And um, this is ETF Guide TV. I'm Ron DeLegge. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you next time.